Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board and the Nebraska Soybean Board. Soybeans are found on dinner tables around the world. Some form of the soybean is found in baby foods, snacks, cooking oils, and many other food items eaten daily. And soybeans provide the protein in the diets for livestock and fish. The Nebraska soybean farmers support research to develop new soy-based products for foods, livestock, and industrial uses through their checkoff dollars. The Nebraska Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board and the Nebraska Corn Board. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. On this episode, Darren Newsom analyzes corn and soybean markets. Greg Ibaugh discusses avian influenza in Nebraska. Dave Aiken recaps state legislative bills involving agriculture. And Scott Irwin talks about proposed renewable fuel standards. Darren Newsom from DTN is our market analyst this week. The USDA is scheduled to release its June crop report Wednesday morning at 11, while estimates on quarterly grain stocks and acreage will come at the end of the month. The latest crop progress report shows U.S. farmers have planted 95% of their corn and 71% of their soybeans. The agency made no changes to corn's condition ratings. The first evaluations of soybeans will come Monday. We talked with Darren Wednesday afternoon and started by discussing the current condition of corn and soybeans across the country. So far, at least according to NASA's weekly reports, the crop conditions still favorable. Uh, in other words, everything looks to be in pretty good condition right now, corn in particular. We didn't see any changes in Monday's numbers. Now, as we get into next Monday's numbers, uh, the next weekly report, we may actually see a little. We may actually see a little bit of a decrease, given the rains, given some of the storms that have moved across the Midwest. Would not surprise me to see, you know, a little bit of deterioration in the crop. Nothing major. Nothing really to get the market's attention, but could see some lower numbers. How the market react, both corn and soybeans, to the RFS announcement last Friday? Initially, we saw a little bit of pressure in the corn market. But as we've worked our way through this week, we're getting close to seeing some technical bullish signals. In other words, signs that this market may finally be getting ready to change direction. And so to me, what that, what that says is that we've put aside a lot of these issues that really were headlines only and there wasn't any meat to them. I mean, we've got a lot of arguing to go about with this RFS before anything actually happens. And so the market seems to be looking ahead now and we'll see if it can build on some of these signals that are starting to show up here this week, or they could quickly fall apart and just evaporate. What could be causing that short term, giving the a little bit of a bullish run here? Biggest thing that we've got going right now is that the U.S. dollar index has come under pressure. And when that happens, a lot of the investment traders, non-commercial traders who are in the market who have actually uh, uh, built short positions, net short positions in these grain markets, are starting to buy some of those back just again on the fact that the U.S. dollar index is coming down. The U.S. dollar index is coming down on the hopes that Greece and the rest of Europe make some sort of deal. Anytime a market is betting on that as their sole crutch for doing something, I think it's pretty weak. Uh, so yes, we've seen the dollar come under pressure, but this could turn around and scream higher again on a dro at the drop of a hat. Last time we talked a few months ago, going out into summer and into fall, you were very bullish, especially in soybeans. Has anything changed since then? No, still bullish, probably leaning more towards the corn market because of the signals that we saw last fall, but but also still in soybeans. And again, this is technically based at, you know, it, it really, because this is looking at the chart that's telling me we should still see some long-term uptrends develop. Now, I think we are reaching a key point here early in the summer where markets are going to have to start to react. We've pushed them about as far as we can go. They're testing the October lows that we, that we built all this off of. If those don't hold, then we could start to see some changes, some long-term outlook changes 
What about for farmers that are holding some old crop corn yet? Do you have any advice for them? I know there's a couple of articles up on DTN this week, one by Katie Mysick, and it talks about that very scenario. And I think we're going to see some movement. Uh, usually farmers have to move here ahead of harvest to clean out some space for the, for the next crop. So I think we're going to see some of that. That's probably going to weaken basis a little bit here over the next couple of months. By and large, I still think we're going to see some holding back as I look at the market and I'm still long-term bullish, I would probably still hold back a little bit, see if this market doesn't improve, but I also understand the logistics. If we have to move it to make room, then we simply have to move it to make room. That 2015 crop, is there anything that looks attractive right now or are you remaining patient there as you look out to new crop sales? Right now I'm gonna to have to remain patient. What we have on the books is what we're going to have to, you know, what we're going to have to be happy with for now or comfortable with for now. If these long-term signals that I've been looking at and holding on to now for quite some time start to fall apart, then we're going to have to change our strategy. And I don't like to chase things down here, but if we break through, that could start a large wave of selling. Monthly crop report is next week. What number, knife to your throat, would you look at? <laughs> uh, if I had to look at it, I'm not anticipating any huge changes because everyone's going to be focusing again on the new crop. What I'm probably going to be looking at is going back to the old crop, and it might be soybean exports, because I still don't know that we're accounting for all of the business that we're done or, or that we might do here to finish off the marketing year. And if we actually do see an increase in soybean exports, old crop soybean ending stocks could get whittled back a little more. Next week, Jeff Peterson from Heartland Farm Partners will join us to look at corn and soybean markets. Since December 19th, the United States has detected more than 200 cases of avian influenza. Those instances together total over 45 million affected birds. Nebraska confirmed its first case on May 12th in Dixon County. The Nebraska Department of Agriculture announced Thursday the state would cancel all poultry events through January 1st, 2016. On Thursday, we spoke with Nebraska Department of Ag Director Greg Abbott to learn more about the virus's impact in the state. Well, right now we have three commercial flocks and one backyard flock that have been diagnosed in, uh, with avian influenza. We're in the process of uh, depopulation and disposal. Two of those are complete and one of those we're still working on. And then uh, uh, we also have another uh, commercial flock that had tested positive on a presumptive positive but USDA has been unable in two different tests to confirm that uh, positive. So we're hoping that maybe uh, with additional testing and we'll go through a period of about 21 days as a whole process that uh, they would stay negative and then we could release that quarantine and not have to dispose of those three million. For the confirmed cases, what's the disposal process? So we're composting on site, uh, which I think has been a decision that uh, we made early on that we were going to try to deal with uh, the disposal on the site and on the premises so that we didn't have diseased birds uh, on the road or tr maybe risk spreading the right. virus that way. And so burial or uh, mm -hmm. composting were the two options and uh, uh, we've chosen composting okay. at all the sites. How long will these flocks or these uh, operations need to be depopulated? How long will they be vacant? So that's still a little bit uh, unknown and I'm not sure that we completely understand that process. Once they're depopulated, then they go through a cleaning and disinfection process, which includes uh, tearing apart a lot of the equipment so that we can flush water lines, get in all the cracks and crevices between like where things are bolted together and everything. And uh, that's, USDA works with the producer to have that done and then there will be testing done to see if the virus exists at the end of that uh, disinfection process. If that's still clean, then there'll be a downtime where they give a chance for it to reemerge, and then they'll uh, test it again, and then if it's negative, probably maybe some sentinel birds. Mm -hmm. So maybe a two or three month process. What assistance from the USDA is available to those producers affected? So uh, there is money for de the depopulation, and uh, some reimbursement for the value of the birds. It's a percentage, it's not full reimbursement by any means. And then since it's a foreign animal disease that USDA prioritizes eliminating and eradicating, uh, they uh, offer assistance with the, the disposal as well as the cleaning and disinfection. Are we learning anything more about how the virus is actually spreading? 
So I think that there are probably some lessons learned there that maybe we need to rethink some of the biosecurity systems that we have within the industry to make sure that uh, the, you know, we're not spreading it between ourselves a little bit. And uh, so I think there's some opportunities there. We still don't really have a clear line of you know, how it got from Iowa to Nebraska. You know, migratory birds are pointed to, but obviously with that season pretty much passed, there's still some type of transmission in play. To close out with, there has been talk about using a vaccine and the USDA has opted not to give approval to that vaccine. What's the pros and cons of doing something like that? So once you implement a vaccination program that has pretty long-term trade implications. So USDA has decided that uh, they want to uh, try to eliminate the disease and uh, keep those long-term trade implications to a minimum. And uh, s since that we would also have to develop the right strain of influenza virus and maybe that would change over time and year to year, that uh, I think this is a good decision on USDA's part, but, uh, and because the virus, the vaccination isn't 100% effective anyway. Our April 3rd episode of Market Journal contains more information on the virus and biosecurity precautions both small and large producers can implement. We'll link to that information on the Market Journal website. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention says the risk to the general public from these outbreaks is low, and the USDA has reminded consumers that properly handling poultry and cooking meat and eggs to 165 degrees internally will kill viruses and bacteria. Nebraska's growers are still behind schedule planting this year's corn and soybean crops. The latest progress report shows farmers are five points back of the state's five-year average in corn and 13 points off the norm in soybeans. As part of a discussion you'll see in full next week detailing ARC and PLC signup, Kathy Anderson from the Nebraska State Farm Service Agency talked with us this week about delayed planting in the state. Kathy said it's important for producers to file acreage reports every year, not only for eligibility and commodity programs, but also to establish cropping histories. So July 15th is our deadline for acreage reporting. Uh, but with this challenging spring that we've had, we want producers to be aware that they should also be thinking about coming in and filed preventing planning claims, not only with their crop insurance agent, but also with the Farm Service Agency because that, again, establishes that cropping history for their records. Um, additionally, if they have got a crop planted, but it was affected by some type of natural disaster and failed, uh, particularly if they are gonna dispose of the crop or put those acres to another use, again, we want them to come in and file those claims for the failed crop. In the case of preventive planting acres, they do need to come in within 15 days of the final planting date. And for corn, that date's moving up forward for us. That would put us at June 9th. Um, the state executive director is requesting an, an extension of that date um, from the deputy administrator for farm programs, but that request um, is, is just now going in. So okay. we hope to have a response on that soon. We'll have more with Kathy next week. As mentioned, farmers need to notify the FSA of crop failure or prevented planting within 15 calendar days of the final planting date. You can contact your local FSA office for more information. The Nebraska legislature adjourned last week. During the first session of the 104th legislature, Nebraska's unicameral adopted two livestock development proposals, along with another bill giving producers agro-tourism liability protection. It failed, however, to pass a bill on custom hog feeding in the state. Earlier this week, Nebraska Extension Ag Law Specialist Dave Aiken joined us to recap the session. LB 106 was the one that dealt with uh, uh, zoning requirements, and uh, that one was changed quite a bit in the legislative process. But the other bill, LB 175, uh, which increases uh, uh, tax breaks for uh, livestock development, that one did go through. Let's talk about LB 106. Explain to me what LB 106 would do. Well, originally uh, it was going to come up with its, what the bill called a matrix or basically a list of zoning factors that the, that the state would establish that counties then had to follow in considering new livestock development proposals. Uh, this turned out to be very controversial with counties and so uh, there was uh, considerable opposition to that and the, the, they ended up making it voluntary rather than mandatory. Let's move on to LB 175. What will that do? 
Well, it makes some funding available to livestock friendly counties, the 29 livestock friendly counties that we have in Nebraska uh, to you know, do some uh, infrastructure development roads and stuff like that. In addition, it raises the state tax credit for new livestock development uh, from uh, $30,000 to $150,000, which means as much a, uh, as you could get 10% off for a development, a new livestock development up to one and a half million dollars. So those are the two livestock bills that went through. Now, a couple months ago, we talked about another one. It was LB-176. What happened to it? Well, that's the bill that would have authorized packer feeding in Nebraska. And that is that the uh, you know packers could own uh, swine and then have those, uh, uh, those swine custom fed uh, under contract. And, and that's a very controversial issue as well, raises the issue of corporate farming and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, they, uh, Senator uh, Schills, uh, had the votes to pass it, but he didn't have the votes to break the filibuster. They got 31 votes and they needed 33 votes to break the filibuster, so he came up two votes short. Why was it so tight? Why was it so contested? Well, I think it's you know kind of the old Initiative 300 corporate farming stuff back again, and the concern that this is gonna be a corporate takeover of the swine industry. Um, other folks, the supporters say, well, look, you know, if we want these packers to stay in Nebraska to make the market uh, for Nebraska, then uh, we've got to give them flexibility to uh, be able to make sure that they're going to have the supply that they need. One of the other agriculture bills that went through or related to was the agro-tourism liability bill. Explain that one to me. Well, uh, outdoor recreation is, uh, uh, is, is getting to be a more significant mm -hmm. economic activity in Nebraska, actually tourism is the third largest industry in Nebraska. I didn't know that. Uh, and so, you know, hunting and fishing and, you know, all sorts of outdoor recreation activities, things that people like to do. Um, farmers and ranchers, if they let people come on their land and they don't charge them anything, then they have a limited liability protection that if the people get hurt 99 times out of 100, the landowner's not gonna be responsible. But if they charge a fee, then it's like they're going on to commercial premises and they are um, and they have a, a much broader liability uh, uh, exposure there. And so that's the, that's the issue. So what is LB3, this is LB329, what does this do specifically? Well, this is something that um, rural groups uh, have wanted for a long time. Basically it gives uh, farmers and ranchers and other rural landowners uh, the opportunity to let, you know, have people come onto their property, but they get a limited uh, liability protection uh, if something goes wrong. And the basic idea is that, you know, when you're out in the country, out on the farm, you know, you're not in a park in town or something like that, you're out in the wilds, so to speak, and so there is some risk of simply being out in the wilds, uh, and that's the, wis uh, the risk that the, uh, that the bill seeks to protect the landowner from. Dave says the agritourism liability is not unlimited. Operators are liable if they don't do things like post warning signs, properly maintain premises, and fail to train employees. Late last week, the Environmental Protection Agency released proposed renewable fuel standards for 2014, 2015, and 2016. The EPA said last year's target, 15.93 billion gallons, was derived from what was actually produced and used. 2015s will scale up to 16.3 billion gallons, and 2016s will increase to 17.4. As the agency admits, the levels are below those initially set by Congress. That includes lowering ethanol mandates to what it believes is actually achievable. Under the proposed number, biodiesel would see an increase. On Thursday, we talked about the latest RFS numbers with University of Illinois ag economist Scott Irwin. We started by asking how valuable the announcement is to the biodiesel industry. I think it's so important that when you back up from the specific numbers, which are clearly important for the industry in the short run, but what's really important for the biodiesel industry is that if one takes the EPA policy as given and projects it for the remaining life of the RFS through 2022, essentially going forward, biodiesel is in the driver's seat rather than corn-based ethanol. Does that mean the industry can expand? Uh, probably. Uh, it's, there, there's a lot of variables that would go into that. Uh, the uh, U.S. EIA estimates that current production capacity for biodiesel in the U.S. is around 2.3 billion gallons and there's a good chance that by 2016 or 2017 uh, we would go past that number. But on the other hand, 
uh, there's quite a bit of mothballed capacity out there. How much of it could come in to play? How much of it's registered for generating the D4 rinse credits? And then in addition, uh, how much competition from imports of biodiesel, conventional biodiesel and renewable diesel would we see? So there's a lot of variables. Was it as bad for ethanol as some of the pro-ethanol groups would believe? I think that depends on uh, what perspective you take. If your perspective is the long term uh, with regard to that key waiver provision and argument that the EPA used, yes, it probably was that bad. Uh, maybe that's from a, a policy perspective. But the standards themselves, the numbers that were proposed for ethanol, particularly in 2015 and 16, um, probably are not quite as negative as um, many people's first reaction, and I would say including my own. If you dig deep into the EPA proposal and look at the details, uh, based on their assumptions, uh, they intended those ethanol mandates to force or pressure or push either higher blends of ethanol or non-ethanol biofuel like biodiesel. Uh, but that was based on the assumptions that they had built into, uh, into their analysis. Do you think it was coincidental or is this an effort to move the wall? The USDA announcing this week that it would spend $100 million to invest in blender pumps. Is that just ironic? I don't think so. Clearly, I mean, it seems to me that that was a definite coordinated um, announcement and it's a part of uh, the EPA intending to provide some push towards higher blends in the ethanol mandates and then providing some incentives on the other side to provide the infrastructure that would uh, help facilitate those higher blends. When you look at the renewable fuel standard, do you think the EPA and Congress are struggling with what the intent or purpose of the law is compared to what it was initially put forward for? There's absolutely a major political struggle, but I think it's probably best characterized as uh, the uh, biofuels groups have one interpretation of the intent of Congress and the petroleum and oil industries have another different interpretation of what the intent was or at least should be now given reality. And that's the clash over the standards and what they mean and how they should be interpreted. The EPA's proposal will be open for public comment until July 27th, and it says it intends to take final action by the end of November. Now with this week's weather forecast, here's Nebraska Extension State Climatologist Al Dutcher. Well folks, here we begin for the weekly forecast. During this last week, of course, we've seen basically thunderstorm activity off and on across the state from Monday on through the remainder of the week with western Nebraska receiving the vast brunt of the heavy precipitation during the early part of the week. And then we've seen the complexes shooting that energy out into the central and eastern portions of the state. And we did have some localized flooding, unfortunately, some very heavy precipitation. That's re the situation in terms of extreme wetness. And we're probably looking at an extended period once again before we see enough drying to where we could, you could comfortably get out into the fields, particularly across the southern one-third of the state. Unfortunately, we still have to deal with more rainfall this weekend and then another large trough moving in next week uh, toward the end of the week that could bring more significant rainfall to the region. So unfortunately, let's get ahead to the weather forecast and see how this is going to play out. I'll draw your attention to the upper air low that's sitting over the western United States. That's been responsible for shooting out the energy into our region and ca carrying the daily thunderstorm chances essentially for the last four days. That is expected to continue as we go through this weekend with thunderstorms once again that broke out last night, exiting the eastern part of the state this morning. Then we'll see redevelopment in the western part of the state during the afternoon and evening hours. And once again, we'll see another complex move across the state, bringing localized heavy precipitation. As we get into tomorrow, what we'll notice is that system kind of peters out and kind of merges somewhat with this trough over the northern plains that's expected to drop southward. So we don't expect to see as widespread a precipitation, maybe some isolated thunderstorms 
in the western portion of the state during the afternoon hours and maybe a few lingering thunderstorms during the morning hours. But outside of that, we're looking at fairly decent conditions through the middle of the state during most of the day. And by Monday, what we're going to notice is a trough digging into the Great Lakes, and that's going to push some cooler air try to at the surface through northern Nebraska and possibly generate some thunderstorm activity with the most likely area situated once again in western Nebraska as we get some up slope flow pushing against the Rocky Mountains and generating thunderstorm activity. Then as we get into Tuesday, if we believe the models, we're going to start to see a clearing and drying trend that will last just a couple days as high pressure tries to build in and we'll see that continue on through the day Wednesday but once again we have another trough that's trying to push down into our region that will start to generate thunderstorms over the central Rockies as we get into Wednesday and that will start to push out into western Nebraska during the afternoon hours and more importantly this whole system will move across the northern plains and generate a widespread area of heavy precipitation at least according to the models currently across most of Nebraska and that will continue on in eastern Nebraska as we get into Friday as the main brunt of this trough starts to dig toward the eastern Corn Belt. Behind it there does look to be a period where we might see some more drying but yet another trough will be entering the picture as we get about four or five days down the road. So if we look at the temperature forecast we are looking at consistently in the 70s to 80s with periodic thunderstorm activity. The heaviest thunderstorm activity is Saturday and then again on Thursday Thursday, but overall this wet trend will continue. We looked at the 8 to 14 day forecast, at least we're starting to see a moderation of the cool temperatures and a return back to normal to above normal temperatures west of us. And in terms of precipitation, we get more close to normal precipitation instead of above normal that we've seen in the past month. Thanks Al. Today's interviews can be found on the Market Journal website and through the Market Journal mobile app. They include information on corn and soybean markets, avian influenza in Nebraska, a recap of the state legislature's session, and the EPA's proposed RFS volumes. As always, you can keep up with Market Journal during the week on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Next week, Jeff Peterson will analyze corn and soybean markets, and we'll learn about sign-up for 2014 and 2015 commodity programs. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board and the Nebraska Soybean Board. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board and the Nebraska Corn Board. When we transform Nebraska corn into ethanol, it doesn't disappear from the food supply. It just takes a little detour. Ethanol is made from the starch. The rest of the corn becomes livestock feed to create meat and dairy products, corn oil, sweetener, and other food ingredients, and maybe a little carbon dioxide to make your soft drinks fizzy. Homegrown ethanol helps satisfy America's hunger for energy and the world's appetite for feed and food. Nebraska's family corn farmers, sustaining innovation.